Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the North York Central Library. Uh, this afternoon's session is uh, part of our Baycrest Health Information Series. The subject is early onset dementia. Uh, and we'll be looking at the effects of developing a dementia under the age of 65 and its impact on the person and uh, his or her family. Um, this session will focus, on different, will focus on different causes of dementia that affect this group and the psychosocial consequences such as the impact on finances, social, physical, and emotional well-being of the family. Uh, interventional strategies for families will be discussed as well. We're really fortunate to have Adriana Schnell here this afternoon. Welcome, Adriana. Adriana is a social worker and she has practiced at Baycrest for over 25 years. She received her Master of Social Work and her PhD from the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Toronto, where she is now, um, she has an academic, an, an academic appointment and teaches there as well. Um, she is the chair of the Caregiving Committee for the National Initiative for the Care of the Elderly. The acronym is NICE and she integrates clinical practice, education, and research interests in the areas of caregiving and gerontology. Welcome, Mary Adriana. Thank you very, very much. And it is a real pleasure for me to be here to talk to you around something that's really important to me that's a big part of my professional life, and it's to talk and to educate people around early onset dementia. And I'll tell you a little bit about how I became interested in this area. I've worked in a memory clinic at Baycrest for over 25 years, and more and more I see, sorry, so it's better if I go here. More and more I see younger people that develop a dementia. So it's not uncommon for me to see people in their 40s and 50s with Alzheimer's disease. And the big frustration for me is that I have no resources for them. There's nothing in our system to address their needs. And so that's where my interest came and I decided to do research in the area because in this time and age in our government, unless we can show numbers and need, nobody listens. So I'm going to talk about what early dementia is, I'm going to, early onset, I'm going to talk about the two most common causes of, these two, of dementia, I'm going to tell you how families cope, and I'm going to discuss with you some interventions that people, families, friends can do with this age group. So I just want to give you a little bit of background in the terminology and the language that I'm using. And although I said questions at the end, if I say something and you don't understand what I mean by it, please ask me, stop me then and say, what do you mean by that? So when we talk about dementia, we really, it's like saying you have a headache. You don't, you don't know the cause of your headache, perhaps. It could be because if you have a fever, because you have an infection, because you have a brain tumor. So it's the same when we use the word dementia. It means that it's a progressive condition that affects people's ability to function at the end of the day. So if you just have memory problems, if you just have problems with reasoning, but your functioning, your ability to manage day to day is not impacted, we don't call it a dementia. We call it mild cognitive impairment, okay? So again, dementia is like saying you have a headache. The two most common causes of dementia in people under 65 are early onset Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia, and I will spend a little bit of time talking about that. I also want to tell you the difference between early onset dementia and early stages of dementia. They're different things, not to be confused. Early onset refers to the time 
when somebody develops the dementia, which is under 65. Early stages refers to the beginning stages of Alzheimer's. You could, have, you could be 90 years old and be in the early stages of dementia. And because of the confusion with the language, we're now starting, I'm calling it more and more young onset dementia. Okay, so you'll hear me talk about young onset. Young onset is the same as early onset, okay? Dementia. And also when, I, when we talk about dementia, generally we talk about early onset and late onset. So late onset is anybody that develops a dementia over the age of 65, and these numbers are totally arbitrary. This is how clinicians and researchers have decided to do things. There's no rhyme or reason for it. Why 65 is the magic number. I think it's because of old age pension. Okay? So in Canada, we have about half a million people with dementia. 14% of those have a dementia that starts under the age of 65. And if you look at uh, Alzheimer's Society stats, they look different. You will see that the number they give you is 750,000. The reason for that is because they include dementia and cognitive impairment together. So the numbers look bigger. So remember, cognitive impairment is you have a problem with reasoning memory, but you're still able to function. Dementia is at the point that you can't use the phone or you cannot drive or do your banking anymore. So it's affecting your function, okay? And that's why I'm giving you this heads up because I always get the question, but the Alzheimer's Society says it's 750,000. And one of the reasons they did it is really a political move because we want to have a strategy in this country to address dementia care. And the more numbers we have, the more chances we'll get a strategy. The majority of people don't understand the difference between dementia and cognitive impairment, so it sounds good. But I'm letting you know so that you have that knowledge with you, okay? So the two most common causes of dementia, as I said, in the under 65 group is the early onset Alzheimer's disease. Who's seen the movie uh, Still Alice here? So it's, it's a Hollywood movie with Julianne Moore around this woman, a psychologist, a professor who develops a dementia under the age of 65 and her journey. And it's actually pretty good. If you're interested more in this topic, it's a good movie to uh, look into. And frontotemporal dementia is a rarer form of dementia, although now we know in the last couple of years the thinking is that it's the most common type of dementia in the under 65 age group. And so this area of young onset dementia is fairly new, and the thinking and the knowledge keeps changing. Every time you go to a conference, you speak to people in the area, new and improved information. The difference between the two illnesses, early onset Alzheimer's disease is really, it robs people of their memory, in a nutshell, if you had to explain it. Um, and so the areas of the brain that are affected, it starts at the back of the brain, and it affects memory loss, word-finding difficulties, and problems with visual-spatial tasks. So I would have a hard time knowing how to use this, knowing right from left and motor skills. And I'm going to show you a video, it's a few minutes long, to show you what early onset dementia looks like. At that point, I felt like I was going to cry. I mean, it was just uh, such an uncertain feeling. It was enough to say, okay, there is, there is a problem. And I had said to my doctor about a year before that I did have memory problems and he and I needed to talk. But, you know, you just sort of put things off.
he took a piece of paper off his pad and, and said, well, here, just draw a clock and make it whatever time he had suggested. And I didn't do it. Shock of my life. You know, when I look at myself in the mirror, and there's nothing wrong physically. It's, it's in the brain. Some outright disputed the, uh, the diagnosis and said the doctor was wrong. You say to the person that you have Alzheimer's and, and they go through the list of stereotypes, well, you can't have it because you're too young, or you can't have it because, in fact, we're able to communicate. I'm going to stop it there before I go into frontotemporal dementia. So when you hear Jim's story, a lot of the issues are really around memory. His emotions seem to be okay. He can talk about, he has some insight into his problems. He says, I have a memory problem, I went to the doctor, we let it go. But he can talk about it. He does not have full insight into the extent of his problems though. So people with early onset Alzheimer's disease will tell you, I forget things, I have a memory problem. But if you say to them, can you drive? They'll say, sure, I'm fine. You speak to their spouse, and they said, oh my God, I wouldn't put my kid or my grandchild or anybody else in the car with him. So people have some insight into their problems, but they don't really realize the full extent of their problems. Frontotemporal dementia is very different. So frontotemporal dementia starts at the front of the brain, the frontotemporal lobes. So the area that affects is very different than Alzheimer's that starts here. But remember, with these two illnesses, they're progressive. So Alzheimer's starts here, and eventually your whole brain loses volume. Frontotemporal dementia starts here and moves to the back of the brain. So at the end of both illnesses, the symptoms look the same. Okay. Frontotemporal dementia has two types. We call it the behavioral variant, where people are really disinhibited, and the big changes are personality changes. That's really what we notice the most. Um, people do bizarre things. People will just, um, they're sexually disinhibited. People will steal things. So people, if I see your purse there, and I have frontotemporal dementia, and I want it, I'd basically just walk and take it, and I would see nothing wrong with it. I want something, I do it. My inhib inhibitions, my frontal lobes are not working very well. Temporal side is, is related to speech, so if it starts more in the temporal lobes, you'll have start problems with communication, understanding, and also speaking. And I'm going to show you... Um, an example through a video of what frontotemporal dementia looks like and you'll realize how different it is from Alzheimer's disease. When he first started to change, I actually, I didn't notice it. I was just baffled just when I had a diagnosis. It was so odd. You just keep thinking something's wrong. He will go outside and sit on the ground for two hours and kill ants. And he lets them crawl up on his hand and he picks them off and puts them in a bucket and counts them. And he keeps track of it and he'll come in and write down that he's killed 985 ants today. And he does our neighbor's yard to him and tells our neighbor how many ants he's killed. He would bike to work and um, change in his cubicle, you know. Not the bathroom. Nick. He pulled my daughter, who wasn't wearing a life jacket and didn't have her inner tube. He took a stick and they were playing a game. He pulled her out into the deep part of the river where the current was fast, and then he dropped the stick and swam away. The doctors would just tell me I was imagining things or I was overreacting. When the friends started saying, "Do you think he's possessed?" which was like. 
oh my god, we've gone off the deep end here. But, you know, then I said, what the hell? Let's go have an exorcism. Let's have a shamanic soul retrieval. Let's do a spiritual cleansing. Whatever it takes, we're going to do whatever it takes. If your loved one was going to experience a loss, how would you feel if they lost their memory versus they lost their emotions? That's what these two diseases do. Alzheimer's really robs the person of memory, and frontal temporal dementia really robs them of their emotions. FTD, uh, which some people call frontal temporal dementia, and a lot of people call it frontal temporal lobar degeneration, um, is a disease that's been around for over 100 years. This disease was beautifully described even before Alzheimer's disease. So it was described by Arnold Pick. A, a Czech uh, a neurologist, a pathologist in 1892. It was once thought of an uncommon disorder, but we're realizing now that in people in middle age, it's probably the second leading cause of dementia um, in line with the prevalence of, of Alzheimer's disease. A lot of the neurology books still say you can't diagnose frontal temporal dementia. They're, they're just absolutely wrong. Frontal temporal dementia hits the frontal lobes. Alzheimer's disease tends to hit the posterior parts of the brain. If you were going to describe the function of this part of the brain, you would call it a, a part of the brain that's critical for emotions, for behavior and emotions. The other really tricky part, too, is I have a mind child. I'm not just the retired spouse. I said, oh, you know, I'm still working age. He's still working age. I have a kid. And then there was no safety net for us when there was a huge conflict of interest about well-being, like what was good for my husband versus what was good for my daughter. And I came to the place where he's dying and she's growing and developing. And, and finally the balance tipped in her favor. And, you know, he has to go into a nursing home. FTD isn't a disease anybody really wants to take. I mean, a lot of them just flat out say that we won't take a, a frontal temporal dementia patient. They're used to Alzheimer's and they're picturing timid little old ladies that they can handle. He's young. He's only 49 right now. And that's really young in the nursing home world. He's physically still, essentially physically able and strong and fit. She said, I think he's a little beyond <coughs> She said, because it's a new place, um, they don't have as broad a range of disabilities, so um, I don't think they're going to take it. Do you think you have any type of brain disease? No. Except I have my memory. It's not as good as it used to be, that's for sure, but I still have a good memory. All right. People think of dementia as memory. So they're familiar with forgetfulness, repetitive questions, maybe getting lost, misplacing personal items, and thinking that means a dementia. And people aren't so used to thinking of, of a behavioral or emotional change as being part of a dementia disorder. The closeness that I had with Bob is gone, so I really don't get that from anyone anymore. I mean, it's like you're alone. But yet someone's there, and sometimes at night when you're laying in bed, you think, he's here, but he's not. But when he's not here, for sure, it's going to be very lonely. But it's very lonely now, so it's, it's a continual day-to-day -day grieving process. I think that little clip is a really, captures frontotemporal dementia really well in that it's a disorder of personality, of lack of empathy, people changing who they are. With Alzheimer's, the good news is you forget, but feelings are still there. People have an ability to feel anger and love and sadness and connections. With FTD, I mean, a typical example is a spouse will, will say to their partner with FTD, I was just diagnosed with cancer. And the spouse will say, what's for dinner? Truly not caring. And it's really horrible for families, you can only imagine, and for friends, to live with somebody who truly does not care. Truly. 
And now they're finding that the brains of sociopaths have shrinkage in the frontal lobes as well. So there's something around our frontal lobes and our ability to feel empathy and things that make us humans. People will tell me, my dog has more empathy for me than my husband. So it's very, very hard for these families um, to go on caring for somebody who physically looks perfectly fine, so nobody believes you. That's the other piece of it. Families, families will say, he's doing this and this and that. The typical response is, what are you doing to provoke this? Or you need marital counseling. There's nothing wrong with him. Because most doctors also will do memories, test, testing memory, but won't look at these other changes, right? Because people are not used to in younger people, 40s, 50s, looking at frontotemporal dementia. That's a little brief introduction around frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and now I'll talk about caregiving. Anything you didn't understand around FDD and Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. So Lewy body dementia is a different cause of dementia, but it's common in older people, over 65 age group. We don't really see Lewy body dementias in the younger set. Lewy body dementia is another cause of dementia. Three things you look for. Parkinsonian syndrome, so people with it will look like they have Parkinson's disease. So you need two out of three. One's Parkinson's, one is what we call fluctuations. So you have really good days and really bad days. You're not stably forgetful. And the third thing is hallucinations. People with uh, Lewy body dementia hallucinate. So you have to have two out of three to diagnose as Lewy body dementia. We don't see that really in the younger group. And there's many causes of dementia, like dementia is the headache, so what causes it? Um, we have stroke, vascular dementia, all kinds of dementias. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So brain injuries predispose people to, ha to developing a dementia. I don't know that they will say that it causes, but people that had a predisposition will, are likely to develop it sooner because not everybody with a brain injury develops a dementia, right? And that's being researched a lot now. Yeah. Can you have both, you mean? And so could you start with Alzheimer's disease and develop FDD or vice versa? It's possible, but generally what happens is more a problem with diagnosis. So you'll have people with Alzheimer's disease under 65 that also have what we call a frontal variant of Alzheimer's disease. They have memory problems, but they're also disinhibited and personality problems. But that's not called Alzheimer's and FDD. It's called Alzheimer's disease frontal variant. As the years go on, it all changes the thinking as new information, as new knowledge is acquired. But right now is generally, because if you have frontal temporal dementia, you don't start with memory problems, which is typical in Alzheimer's. So you couldn't have both at the same time. However, when the frontotemporal dementia progresses and it moves to the back of the brain, you do start having memory problems, right? Okay. Um, I really like this quote by Rosalind Carter because it's so true. There are only four kinds of people in the world those who have been caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So most of us don't escape this world alive without having experienced one of those. In younger, with younger people, younger people that don't have caregivers, guess what happens to them? 
they end up in jail, generally. Because most people don't realize they have a medical problem. They get in trouble with the law, they speak out, they say something, there's nobody to advocate for them. And you end up in a forensic unit at some psychiatric hospital. But really, it's a forensic, it's under, and you're not treated necessarily. And most likely, a lot of older people uh, in our jail system, a lot of them would have had, had one of these illnesses that nobody bothered to diagnose. With younger people, some of the bigger difficulties is that people are generally employed at the time of diagnosis. Unless, unlike when you're 85, um, that you may not be working, most likely you're not working, younger people are working. They also have dependent children and parents. They're generally physically fit, they're active, and they have a lot of financial commitments. People don't plan to stop working in their 40s, 50s, early 60s necessarily. And they're more likely to have a rarer form of dementia like FTD. And you have to understand the stress um, that, it, that it would have on a family member when you develop a dementia, especially frontotemporal dementia in this age group. And I'll use a quote from my, one of my, res my res I, I did research on spouses and partners of people with a young onset dementia. And this is really typical of what these families experience. I cannot work, I have to be a full-time caregiver. I would not have made enough money to pay for quality care, and I would still have to come home and do the shopping and cooking and cleaning. With my husband not working for four years and me not working for two, we have kids at school. We have to count every penny. I've got no pension. Right now, we're on my husband's dental care package and all the benefits. That will stop when he dies. When his long-term disability stops, I will be poor. And this is a lucky person because the husband was diagnosed before being fired and was able to go on long-term disability and was not self-employed and everything fell into place. Generally what happens with this group is you're not performing at work, you get fired for poor performance, and then you have no pension, no anything. When you get fired from a job, you sign something to your employer that you will not appeal it. You can't go back six months a year later and say, by the way, my doctor now diagnosed me with frontotemporal dementia, there is a reason why I was acting this way, Please put me back on your disability pension. No. So these people are in their 50s, 40s, now no source of income. And you can't appeal it. So they were lucky that they realized there was a problem at work. Well, and again, what's so hard about these illnesses is that they're really, the timing of their onset is unexpected. And again, this is a typical quote of another family I saw. I worked while the kids were at school, and I would work every other Saturday, and I'd get a babysitter for part of the time. Then eventually, my youngest, who was eight years old, was having trouble with his toilet training, and children's aid became involved. They then realized that my husband had Alzheimer's disease, and he was also incontinent, which explained my son becoming incontinent as well. They provided some support, but I could have done without the stress of children's aid involvement. So most families, where there's an early young onset dementia, where there's children in the home, children's aid becomes involved. Somebody, a teacher calls, somebody calls. Rightly so, they're concerned. But you could only imagine the stress of these families, because now not only you have to care give, you have no money, now you have the children's aid on your back, and generally, children's aid is, their line, and again, rightly so, is unless you remove your partner or the person with a dementia, we're removing your children. What are people supposed to do? Right? And the big issue with dementia in this age is that I, I call it a triple financial threat. So the patient loses their income, 
the patient doesn't qualify for financial programs. So if you're under 65, you don't qualify for old age pension unless you have some private pension or anything else, you're in trouble. Nobody cares that you have this illness. And then the spouse, generally, has to cut back to look after the person with dementia. So it's very common for these families to go from upper, middle class, whatever, to poverty. Unless they they have some, you know, private insurance or they're diagnosed early enough before they're fired or they stop. Because this is the other thing people do. People can't cope at work. They don't know what's wrong with them. They quit. They just, I, I can't work anymore. I have to quit. This is too stressful. Instead of going, thinking, I better go to a doctor and get checked, go on stress leave until I figure out. And one of the things I do continuously the minute somebody gets a diagnosis or has trouble, even before a diagnosis, go on short-term medical leave. Before you get fired, until we figure out what your diagnosis is. Because otherwise the repercussions are just too great for people. And this is another typical quote. Um, mortgages for people. You know, a lot of things are based on family income. They don't look at the fact that you have kids in school, maybe university, and now you have to pay a nursing home fee for your partner. Banks, governments don't care about that. They just look at, this family's making so much money, you don't qualify for any reductions of any sort. Um... Again, paying, you lose your job, who pays for medications? If you're over 65, you'll get old age, you know, you get your medications through old age pension, through your card. If you're under 65, unless you're on welfare or, or ODSP, what do you do? So, on average, it takes five years for younger people with dementia to get a diagnosis. And generally, people are misdiagnosed early on. Um, people will say, you know, there's depression, menopause is a typical one, or midlife crisis. This is a typical one. Oh, he's going through a midlife crisis. Or, oh, she's menopausal, she's forgetting, she, whatever. People typically will go on antidepressant medication, but it doesn't help. So you would think somebody would catch on that nothing's helping and people are still getting worse. But on average, not just in Canada, but in the world, it's five years till you get a proper diagnosis. So you could see the damage that happens over that time. And we have people, now tax season, do you think that people with dementia file their taxes on time or file them at all? No. So nobody realizes there's a problem, especially if it's, if it's a couple situation and say one always did it. You don't know that there's a problem necessarily. And before you know it, I had a family who accrued over $80,000 because the interest kept accruing. The wife had no clue of anything. Do you think that when she went with a, a letter from the doctor to the CRA to explain, they did anything about it? Too bad. We'll help you pay it in smaller installments. That's about it. So I always joke, what's a sign of a young onset dementia? <laughs> I had years and years and years ago a client who I call her my the cashmere and pearls kind of person, suburbia wife with the kids, prim and proper. Out of nowhere, she started to develop this love for motorcycles and young men and would pick up young men and take off. The husband was really appalled. The children, who were in their early 20s, were like, finally, mommy's liberating herself. She's enjoying life. Good for her. For all these years, she just took care of us. Everybody had an explanation for it. 
midlife crisis, the husband is in menopause, she's tired of her life, the children good for her. Well, sure enough, she had frontotemporal dementia. And we look back, somebody like Ralph Klein, the premier of, of Alberta, does anybody remember him, know of him? He was like his personality, his drinking. Well, guess what he died of? Frontotem frontotemporal dementia. So it's easy for us to assume that when he had that personality, the big personality, that he was already had FTD. And everybody attributed to the personality, all the drinking. People with frontotemporal dementia develop a lot of um, taste for sweets, and they totally overeat sweets, and they'll steal candy, chocolates, or alcohol. So if one glass is, I had a client who, the doctor said that a glass of red wine is good for me, therefore three bottles must be better. And they, they become really compulsive about whatever it is that they do. So when you look at Ralph Klein's behavior, you wonder how much of all of that was already, and nobody did anything, right? Um, the thing we worry about, I worry about as a social worker, is the level of stress for these families, these young families. Um, we always worry and put all our resources in caregiving with older adults. And we forget that younger people affected by dementia actually have higher levels of stress. And we don't have anything really to give them or support them with. We don't have programs for them. The other thing we know is younger people with dementia, their families have to caregive, or, caregive for longer, for a longer period of time. So the burden, we know that the burden of caregiving is related to the length of time of it being a caregiver. This is, a, this is longer. Um, the other thing we know is women and men deal with stress differently when it relates to caregiving. Women tend to develop more um, psychiatric disorders like anxiety and depression men develop what we call metabolic disease, so high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, um, those kinds of things. But stress is stress, and it takes its toll. The other worry that this fa these families have is the genetic component of these illnesses. People that develop a dementia that are younger have a much stronger, um, there's a stronger relationship with a genetic component. It's not 100%, but there's certain genes, and this keeps changing monthly, what they're finding out. Um, you're more predisposed, your children are more predisposed to developing a, a young onset dementia. And we see fa in our clinic, we see families, like generations of uh, people with these dementias. It's a huge worry. People with late onset dementia, over 65, there's a, way, there's a small component related to genetics. It's not so strong. The older you are, people in their 90s, 50-50% chance of developing a dementia. So it's related, correlated with age, or it's more of a risk factor. So. So, I'm, I'm sorry, we started a bit late. What's our time like, or? Okay. Um, so, couples, we worry about spouses a lot. And so, in our clinic, we try to see all spouses of younger people with dementia. Because about 99% of them have depression. They're really high risk. And people will tell me, well, wouldn't you be depressed if you were in my situation? But what we know about depression is regardless of the reason why you develop it, you still have to treat it. Depression is depression. So we need to get these partners on board early on. 
Um, people are really high risk of uh, drinking, over-the-counter drugs, all kinds of things, just uh, self-treatment, <laughs> really. This group of people experience loneliness. People will talk about how lonely they are. And what's so hard for the world to understand is like that woman said in the clip, is that you, you deal with this ambivalence, like you have your partner there, but they're not who they were. People don't let you talk about your partner in bad ways. So it's very common for a spouse to say, he's a monster, I hate him, I hate who he is now. Nobody lets you say that about your partner. Oh, but he's ill, he should be nice. People really feel hate towards their partner that's ruining their lives. And it's okay for people to express that, but people are very judgmental. <laughs> Healthcare professionals, friends and neighbors, people can't really say how they feel to the world. So not only are they lonely at home with this partner who's not really their partner, but they can't share how they feel with anybody because people just don't get them. Sorry, the huge piece with this group of people is there's a whole bunch of people with early onset dementias that never come to the attention of the healthcare system because their families, their partners, leave them before they're diagnosed. So you could imagine if you had a partner who started going with prostitutes all of a sudden, taking off in motorcycles, abusing young children, you'd be out of there without knowing that this person is, has a dementia, really. So they don't come into the attention of the healthcare system. It, interestingly, some families, when they find out that there's a medical reason for the problem, they come back. There's an explanation. Um, most people can deal with a medical explanation. They cannot deal with personality changes. And it makes sense. Um, so the one thing to remember about these dementias is that we can't talk about families and how it's impacting families at one point in time. If a dementia lasts eight years, people handle it differently at different points of the illness. So before you get a diagnosis, People are in shock, they're in denial. Very common for husbands to say, and again, there's gender issues around caregiving. Men, for the most part, men and women handle it differently. Men will be surprised at a diagnosis of dementia in a spouse. A lot of men, actually, with frontotemporal dementia, they love their spouse that now is sexually disinhibited. Finally, things are great, so she's not making dinner anymore, big deal. And they get a call from the place of employment, you know, your wife, she's free. She's like, she's told the boss to go fly a kite. She's acting inappropriately. He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. She's fine. So it is really, really difficult for these families to believe sometimes that there's a medical diagnosis, a reason for the behavior. And a lot of the work is around helping people understand that th this is an illness. In the later, late stages of the, you know, when they've been caregivers for like five, eight, ten years, things change. They never get easier, but they get different. People kind of have learned how to take care of themselves so that they can move on. And interestingly, in spite of how difficult it is, people cope. I mean, this is human nature. We kind of muddle through it. Um, and the way people do it is they find you can take it one day at a time. You cannot plan for the future. You cannot because everything changes daily with somebody with a young onset dementia. Families have to become real advocates for their partners, because nobody believes you that there's something wrong. Or people will go to the emergency department, you, you look young and fit. For example, somebody I had fell, actually fractured his leg. They went to emerge. 
he could, they asked him, what's wrong? Does something hurt? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. They sent him home without treating the fracture. And when the wife went to the doctor the next day and said, like, what's happening here? It's like, well, they asked him if he was fine. He has a dementia. When you're older, if you don't make as much sense, people will ask somebody else. When you're younger, the assumption is that you're capable. Um, brief framing's a big one. So the way people look at the world, which really helps, is to give meaning to their experience. This is how we, most of us cope. Um, so people will say, maybe this happened to us because I had somebody who said to me, because I had to learn patience. <laughs> it was a pretty hard lesson. <laughs> but people make meaning out of their situation. And it's really an, um, let's see. Oh, somebody who, some people with dementia are very vocal, and so they sing constantly. And it's really annoying when you live with somebody who's singing at the top of their lungs nonstop. So the husband's way of looking at it is, she must be happy. She sings all the time. And this helped him manage. Um, things like when you place a partner, that's for most families the most traumatic uh, thing that they've done as caregivers to make those decisions. So a way to do it is, I didn't place him, the disease did. Um, somebody who, this woman really wouldn't tolerate anybody bathing her or dressing her, and she'd lash out, and, like, and she was young and strong. And the husband said, you know, she, she, this is her way of trying to help me. Like, she's really trying to put her arms through it, but she can't, so she goes like this. But it's really a way to cope. Instead of looking at how horrible the situation is, is looking at, she's trying to help me, but she's not able to. And things like this really goes a long way for people. And so one of the things I do is try to help people look at things differently. Things are not going to get better, but maybe how we look at things. You know, the, the f lens we give it may help people continue on. Oops, sorry. Um, the other thing that... Um, we try to teach people is how to look after themselves. And there's nothing worse for a caregiver than to be told, look after yourself. People get furious at you if you say that. You need to be specific. You need to understand what it is that makes people feel better. And I always tell people the metaphor of, you know, when you're flying in case of a um, cabin loses pressure. If you're traveling with a dependent, you put your oxygen mask first then you put it on your dependent. You can't help any, you're of no value to anybody unless you're okay. And it's the same thing for caregivers. It's not being selfish to go out with a girlfriend and see a movie. It's because they have to be a caregiver, they have to take care of themselves. And so you help people see that they must look after themselves. It's not a luxury, they shouldn't feel guilty about it. They need to do this. And it's helping people find ways. I mean, I had somebody who, she said sometimes where I can't take it anymore, I just look at the window and I see a bird, and that gives me hope. So sometimes you don't need time to self-care. It's helping people find what, is, what can you do in instance to recharge you, even if for a few more minutes. Um, and last thing, I was really blown away, and I'm not sure why, but it really was, the amount of how spirituality and religion really helps people. And I don't know why I was really blown away, because a lot of people are spiritual, a lot of people have religion. You don't think of it in younger people so much. Almost everybody I interviewed talked about the importance of, if it wasn't faith or religion or community, it's around meaning-making, of finding uh, 
peace in nature, this is life, using words like meant to be, this is life, um, there's a bigger purpose that we may not be aware of. Um, and I guess it really shocked me, but more and more I'm very in tune with that with families when they start talking, and I ask about it more and more, about um, spirituality, religion, and what, how, in whichever way people define it, which really varies. Um, so, last thing. How can people, friends, help? Very easy. <laughs> One thing is we need to be, just like when I talk about self-care, we need concrete things. Go out for coffee with your friend at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Is asking, what can I do to help you? But things like, can I babysit your child? Can I take your dog for a walk? Can I bring you dinner? Do you want to go out for coffee with me? Um, people don't know how to ask. People don't want to ask. But when you give them something specific, people will take it. Um, listen, one of the caregivers' biggest complaints is that nobody gets them. Everybody's tired of their story. They feel like they're burdens, and they don't want to talk about it. Not they want to talk about it, but nobody wants to listen. So if you're a true friend, neighbor, relative, and you really want to help, sit down and listen. And you don't have to say much of anything. Just listen. And most importantly, if you worry about somebody being depressed, please make sure they go to their family doctor to get uh, help. This group is under-treated all the time. They don't get the help they need. They're depressed. And you need, sometimes when people are depressed, they're too overwhelmed to even realize they're depressed. They don't even have, think that they should go and discuss it with the doctor because they take it as the normal part of life. Um, here are some examples. This, these are typical examples of what burden, people that are burdened or depressed experience. So people are really stressed, tense all the time. Um, they can't get out of bed sometimes. They have a lot of anxiety, anger. They lose it constantly. They're irritable. Um, things don't give them pleasure anymore. So before they would have liked to go for a run, now they just can't get out the door anymore. Um, they get into a lot of conflicts with people. They isolate themselves. You know, we all know friends, people in our families that you think, oh, my God, I don't know how they're managing. And the more help they need, the more they really make it impossible for anybody to get near them. They become really not nice people, <laughs> really. They're not appreciative. They're just kind of leave me alone, they blow up a lot of the times. Um, we worry about people, you know, when they get, start getting more colds, sore backs, they're not sleeping well, uh, and people start drinking more, smoking more, eating more or eating less, so any extreme we worry about. So these are all signs for you, for people to pay attention, um, to realize somebody may be depressed above and beyond being just a caregiver. Um, and I'm going to finish here. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions now. The name of the movie you, you mentioned earlier in the... Oh, Still Alice. Still. Still Alice with Julianne Moore. And it, she won an Oscar for the movie this oh. last year. Anyone else? I have a question. Yeah. Oh. Can you tell about cases of abuse towards the patients? Abuse? To patients. When caregivers abuse patients. Oh, yeah. So this is one thing we really depress and overwhelm caregivers when you're irritable when you're upset, when you've had too much, you're more at risk of abusing somebody. Not always, but we look at... There, and there's different types of abuse for caregivers. One could be financial. 
So we take advantage of the situation and we take their money. One is physical. You get so frustrated, I just slap someone. Come on, get dressed. Slap. Or when you're feeding somebody with a dementia, it takes really long to eat, to swallow, because they forget. You put food in their mouths and sometimes they play with it. People get impatient. They shove food down their mouth. That's abuse. Neglect. You just leave them in a room in front of the TV all day long because, like, they're happy there. <laughs> just like, good luck to you. They don't complain to anybody. There's, so there's family, family abuse. There's also professionals or caregivers that abuse people. There's, it comes at every level. Abuse. We worry a lot about abuse because any population that's vulnerable, and people with dementia are vulnerable, are, can be abused. Are, and, and they can't tell you, so nobody would know. But it's very common. Very common, unfortunately. And we don't have laws to protect adults. We have laws to protect children from abuse. But when you're an adult, You're on your own. And if you're vulnerable and if you can't speak or you can't remember, you're really on your own. What do you do? You mentioned that uh, how do you help someone who doesn't think there's a problem, uh, but it's so important to get an early diagnosis, yeah. or how do, you, how do you do that? How do you recommend that people go about doing that if if, if that's the situation where the person thinks there's nothing wrong anyway. So it's really difficult. Um, so when there's two, the most important thing is to get somebody in the family or a friend on board that there is a problem. Because the, what's even more difficult is when nobody sees there's a problem. As an outsider, you can't get them help, I mean, unless the relative or somebody does something. So the first thing is to make sure somebody in their circle of care realizes there's a problem and is on board. But then to get that person to say, I think you have a memory, what I'm concerned about your health, we need to go to the doctor. Some people will refuse. They know what's at stake. They realize they're having problems. They don't, there's nothing, or, or they have total lack of insight. People do all kinds of things. I mean, a lot of people will speak to their doctors on their own and will say, I need your help. This is what I'm noticing. He doesn't want to come to the appointment. So some doctors are really good about it, and they will call themselves and say, Mr. Smith, you need to come in. You're due for your whatever checkup. So you do it against the person really know it. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, you have to wait for a crisis to happen. There's no other way around it. Something will give at some point. Either you get into trouble with the law, with the bank, you fall, you get lost, you have a car crash. Something gives. And then it's the only time you have to intervene. And it's very horrible for families, for friends to experience this, knowing that there's something that could have prevented this. But when people are in that, are in that kind of gray area, that they're, not real, they're still functioning enough, you can't make them do things against their will. You just can't. So it's really horrible place to be, that great time. People with dementia. Sport exercise? Yeah. Yeah, so, so we know now that physical health and exercise is related to brain health, better brain health outcomes. So when people say, well, what can I do to get better? Exercise, move. Exercise has a lot of benefits. First of all, we now know that exercise is not just good for your body, physical health, it's brain health now. That's known now. So anything that brings more oxygen to the brain, that keeps us, reduces our stress, that reduces our body mass index, or our weight, uh, being overweight is a risk factor for dementia. So it's all stuff we constantly tell people, get moving and get eating better. There's not much you can do, but that will help. If nothing else, it'll help you get out and be active and be physically healthier too. But we really recommend it.
But it's hard because when people, are, if people haven't done anything their whole lives, yeah. Uh, by the way, now you need to better get exercising. But you try to find ways, show people ways to become more active. So if somebody has a memory problem, you don't want them starting to go walking on their own because you don't want them to get lost. So you have to find strategies. You don't want them on a treadmill because as part of having a dementia, balance is affected. So there are risks for, you know, treadmills, you need to have your balance. I mean, unless you go really slow. So it's fa finding ways. I like stationary bikes, spinning or something, because you can't get lost, you can't fall off your bike. And you can exercise to music sometimes that, you know, that you like. But moving, being outside, um, very, very important. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, did you ever come across people who have this FTD and also um, they have autism or perhaps... Autism? Yeah. So, no, although there, there are a lot of people that we see in the clinic with bipolar disease that go on to develop frontotemporal dementia. Autism, we don't see. There's a correlation. People with Down syndrome are very, very likely as they get older in their 50s to develop Alzheimer's disease. So Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease, um, they're in the same kind of gene. It's very, very common. But I've never heard of, um, of that one. However, the other thing we know is these illnesses start changing the brain about 20 years before the illness manifests itself. So a lot of people say, well, he was always this or that, or she was always, and you wonder, was it really, was the person on the spectrum, like, and then developed it, where they're always, their brain's different. And we just, we don't know enough about brains to say, is there something different about certain people? Because we don't see these changes till there's clinical, till people act differently. But the changes have been going on and on and on for 20 years, so maybe there is something. Is there any, uh, I don't know, any pharmacological development? Is there any hope or promise of medical or, um, yeah, medical so, hope? There's always hope, and this is an area that everybody's investing a lot into trying to find a cure. Um, there, there are medications, nothing, there's no cure right now. The medications that exist just slow down the progression of the memory problems. With FTD, generally people are put on medications to treat the symptoms. So if they're compulsive eaters, they'll be put on antidepressant medication to help with the OCD-ish behavior. If you have somebody who's hallucinating or having that, they'll put on antipsychotic drugs. But they're just dealing with the symptoms. They're not treating the illness, per se. But there's, there are a lot of research projects going on, and things keep changing. I mean, I've been in this business almost 28 years, and the thinking's changed dramatically, yet there's no cure. <laughs> but we know a lot more, and we'll see. Any correlation with COPD? Uh, I'm thinking just because it does limit the oxygen that I can don't be, know. Yeah. I don't know. But anything that affects the heart health will affect brain health. And now we know more and more that all these things are so interrelated. We know that families with psychiatric illness have a higher rate of developing neurological diseases. What is it about it? What is it about the brain? Is there a difference between psychiatry of the brain and neurology of the body? Maybe there isn't. Maybe everything, not maybe, for sure. Everything's more connected than we thought before. Depression is an early... For Alzheimer's, people that develop depression later in life, they never had it before. It's um, have a higher um, rate of going, be, developing Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I want to thank you very much. This has really been so informative, and it's just an, it's an amazing area, isn't it? It's just It's amazing so unless sad. it affects your life. <laughs> yeah, gosh. Yeah. Very horrible for families. Join me. Thank you very much. Okay. It's my pleasure. <laughs>